make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, scientific notation is officially defined for us here uh, as the product of a number A, uh, where A happens to be a number between 1 and 10. Please notice not including 10. 10 is not a number that can appear as your first number in scientific notation. And then the second thing is 10 raised to a power. So once again, it is the product of a number A, where A is between 1 and 10, not including 10, and 10 raised to a power. <laughs> so what you're going to see underneath that definition are two just little examples I'd like you to jot down. What you see is a number that is written in scientific notation. It's 1.2 times 10 to the fourth power. And then you see a number not in scientific notation. That number I chose was 12 times 10 to the third. So I need to focus your attention first on what the difference is, like why one is in scientific notation and why the other one isn't. So I'd like you to take a moment and look at that. Again, the one in scientific notation was 1.2 times 10 to the fourth power. And the other one that wasn't in scientific notation is 12 times 10 to the third. Can anybody tell me why the one on the left is in scientific notation or why that meets our definition for scientific notation while the one on the right doesn't? Go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, very good. And uh, since I'm recording you guys today, uh, for the folks at home, they won't be able to hear you. 12 is not a number between 1 and 10. It's too big. 12 is indeed bigger than 10. So that number is not in scientific notation. <clears throat> Next thing I have to point out to you, I don't know if you realize this or not, but those two numbers are exactly the same. Bless you. Do you know that those two numbers are the same? 12 times 10 to the third and 1.2 times 10 to the fourth are the same number. So that makes you think about, well, how do you turn a number from scientific notation into like, I don't know, normal people numbers? So I throw that out to you. How do you turn like 1.2 times 10 to the fourth into like a regular number? Remember how to do that? Good, Joe. Uh, that's if you have a calculator handy, right? Mm, Claire, kind of move the decimal. Yeah, that's what you do. So I just wanted to review this real, really quickly with you. I know most of you are sitting currently in a chemistry class. A lot of you are anyway. Uh, you did this a couple times already this year. Yeah, so I'm not going to beat the horse. But uh, case in point, you know, maybe you need a quick review, you know. You, you, the only tool you think you have right now is a calculator, but you, you have your brain, too. 1.2 times 10 to the fourth, just to review that with you, you move the decimal, like Claire said. 10 to the fourth, make no mistake about it, is a big number, okay? Which means that we have to turn 1.2 into a big number. To do that, you have to move the decimal point to the right, four spaces. One, two, three. What do you fill in those little bubbles? Yeah. So 1.2 times 10 to the fourth is numerically equivalent to 12,000. Same thing with 12 times 10 to the third. You can take 12, move the decimal out three places, poof, 12,000. We all good with that? Okay. So we just kind of talked about uh, briefly, you know, to get your attention on today's lesson, the definition for scientific notation. I just wanted to take a little moment to talk to you about what we're doing today in class. Yesterday, we filled out a gold graphic organizer. Our mission for today's lesson is to apply those properties to some real world examples. So you're looking at your word problems, and then we could also apply these things to geometry. You folks know that scientific notation gets used quite a bit in the real world. Can anybody tell me where you've used it before? I think most of you just said one a few minutes ago, right? In chemistry, when do you use it in chemistry, Ray? Oh, you're not, okay. Well, well, thank you. You do use it in chemistry. Anybody tell me when? 
Yeah. Like the mole. Right? Yeah, you... Yeah, yeah and like... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, it's sing digs, I heard it. Yeah, you have to use it for sing digs too. And Avogadro's number, right? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, right? Yeah. That's, that's like June 20, that's like the mold day, right? Just like pie day in math class? Yeah, we have the mold day. It's in the summer. Mr. Ebert throws himself a big party, I heard. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. Okay. To be honest with you, it does have applications outside of your chemistry class. You know, when we, you know, in this case, we're going to talk about something gross. We're going to talk about a swarm of bugs, you know. So there's applications for biology and, and some other places where you're going to see scientific notation actually comes in handy. We can use our properties of exponents in conjunction with scientific notation to make some of those big numbers easier to work with. So we are going to follow, you know, our four-step approach for word problems. Step one, we read it, we identify what we know and what we don't. We write a verbal model, we write an equation, and then we solve. So that's in general what we're going to go ahead and do when we look at this problem. So step one, we read it, identify what we know and what we don't. So we have locusts. A swarm of locusts may contain as many as 85 million locusts per square kilometer and cover an area of 1,200 square kilometers. About how many locusts? are in such a swarm. So that's us reading it. Can anybody tell me one information, one piece of information, I'm sorry, that they were able to pick out of this particular problem? Maisie. Yeah, so we have a number of locusts, right? Per square kilometer. And you said that's 85 million, right? So today's lesson, you may have guessed, is very much about scientific notation. Uh, so we should probably take this number and write it in scientific notation, just while we're thinking about it. 85 million is an 85 with six zeros after it. Can anybody tell me what this number would be in scientific notation? Go to Elizabeth. Very good, so 8.5 times 10 to the, and we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 8.5 times 10 to the 7th is the number of locusts per square kilometer. Is there any other information you were able to pull out of this word problem? Ray. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, good. So the area covered. And uh, this is in square kilometers. It's equal to 1,200. And again, today is about scientific notation. So I guess my question is, what is this number in scientific notation? Elizabeth? you guys have hit the limit on what I know about the problem. What do I not know in this problem? Or what am I trying to find? Anton. Yeah, our total number of locusts, we don't know that. And when we don't know something in math class, we use a variable to describe it. So, I don't know, I need a letter. Anton, this was your call. A for Anton. Or were you thinking amount of locusts? Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying that my fourth period pick L. Clearly for Lucas, not for locusts. Yeah. Okay. So, just so I point that out to you, Anton. Um, what we need, need to do is we have the information that we know and we have the information that we don't. After you go through this first step, you want to write a verbal model. Now, for some of you, this step is necessary. Some of you are bridging the gap nicely between your knowns and unknowns to your full equation. For the sake of our class, I'd like to, us to get a little bit more practice writing the verbal model. So, verbal model that'll help us identify how many locusts 
are in such a swarm, our total number of locusts? A verbal model that'll help us figure that out. Kendall, are you no, just, just swinging this thing? What do you think, Maisie? Yeah, very good. Okay, so what she's saying for a verbal model, pretty, pretty clear. She said this times this gives me this. So we're going to write that out. If I want to know the total number of locusts, I have to take the amount of area that they cover times the number of locusts in each square kilometer. So let's uh, write that out, shall we? Our verbal model looks like. Uh, a, uh, total number of locusts in the whole swarm equals, total number of locusts in the swarm equals our number of locusts. And this was per square kilometer times uh, the area that's covered. Now, Maisie, I have a question for you. Why did you pick a product uh, for this problem um, as opposed to maybe like a quotient? Why were you multiplying in this, in this problem? If you know that how many locusts are in one square kilometer, and there's 1,200 of those squares, it's a lot faster as opposed to doing 85 million times 85, or I'm sorry, 85 million plus 85 million plus 85 million plus 85 million, adding up all those 1,200 square kilometers. It's actually faster to just multiply the 85 million by 1,200. So that's indeed why we're going to use a product. You had it precisely correct. Um, another way of thinking about it is, you know, you could use your like. Um, you know, if you want to think about your canceling of your units, uh, we're going to reduce out that, col that kilometer squared to get the total number of locusts in the swarm. Uh, that's another way you could think about it, too. But yeah, product is correct. Good job. So what we don't know um, is the total number of locusts in the swarm. And Maisie told us it's the product of the number of locusts per square kilometer times the area covered, which is um, our number of kilometers squared. Uh, we have our verbal model. Now we write an equation, right? So total number of locusts in the swarm, that's A. Number of locusts per square kilometer. This, in scientific notation, was 8.5 times 10 to the 7. And the area covered, in scientific notation, was 1.2 times 10 to the 3rd. Just like that. Okay. Now, to be very clear, multiplication is multiplication. It's not like the dot takes precedence over the little x. Multiplication is multiplication. No one multiplication is more important than another. What is nice about multiplication is that it is both commutative and associative. So we can rearrange this multiplication to make life a little easier on us. And I, I do know that you had to do a little bit of this on your homework last night. For instance, I can take my <coughs> decimals and put those together. 8.5 times 1.2 and bring down my other times and multiply my powers of 10 together. So that's just me regrouping the problem or using my associative property of multiplication so that I could use yesterday's lesson. Do you see how yesterday's lesson kind of gets pulled in a little bit? Uh, I'm going to use my product property. I have 10 to the 7th times 10 to the 3rd. 10 to the 7th times 10 to the 3rd. You're allowed to add those exponents together. So over here, we get 10 to the 10th. 8.5 times 1.2. We're looking at 10.2, right? 85 times 12. 
Move your decimal a little bit. There's a problem with that answer. Do you see it? Oh. Show of hands, who sees it? Oh, look at you guys. Josh, can you tell me what it is? Sorry. When you say it. Yeah, very good. So that number there, 10.2. It's no good. It's too big. So we got to fix that. Anybody got any ideas? Ooh, go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, very good. You add one to the exponent because we are making the number on the left a little bit smaller. Here's what's going on in Michelle's head right now. I'll just show you what she just told me. 10.2. Uh, she said you can move this decimal over one place to make it that number between 1 and 10. So in actuality, this number gets written in scientific notation as 1.02 times 10 to the first. And she said times 10 to the tenth kind of comes down. And then she said, you just add those exponents together because, again, we're dealing with like bases. So this is 1.02 times 10 to the 11th power. Ultimately, when you answer a word problem, you got to be a little bit more specific than this. Uh, there are 1.02 times 10 to the 11th locusts in this swarm. Gross. So disgusting. Ugh. Bugs. What's that? They're loud and gross. That's probably what you need to know. Yeah. And they hang on the tea, tree, yeah. Cicadas. Ew, so gross. Okay. Oh, sorry. I scrolled off of that and I didn't mean to. So. Do you see how our four steps kind of came together to help us answer this word problem? We read it and we pulled out the information that we knew and the information that we didn't know. We kind of wrote a verbal model to help us write an equation. And then after we wrote that equation, we solved it. And we figured out what we didn't know, answered the question. Questions about that? Alrighty, we have one more word problem to do. It's not even really so much a word problem. Uh, it's a geometry application of this business. Uh, so if you can go ahead and turn the page for me. Do you? That's good to know. It is different courses for... <laughs> All right. Ooh, lots of opinions. Makes me nervous. Okay. So, example three. Comparing real life volumes. Are you ready? Here we go. Uh, we're going to follow the same process that we normally follow with regard to these problems. Uh, we're going to read it. This problem is kind of nice because it very much sets up like, oh, declare your variable. Oh, here's your verbal model. So, our textbook editors did a nice job giving us some supports to help us set up this problem. Um, I'm quite confident that most of you probably could have, with a little bit of conversation between all of us, come to, to the conclusion about this verbal model. But let's read the problem, we'll talk about it. We have a beach ball. Uh, it says the radius of a beach ball is about 5.6 times greater than the radius of a baseball. You buying what they're selling? Beach ball, big. Baseball, little. Uh, so the radius of the beach ball, you remember what a radius is? Connects the, a point in the center to a point on the sphere itself. Okay. Uh, so that's your radius. Uh, of the beach ball is 5.6 times greater than the radius of a baseball. Spatial reasoning, we're all good? Cool. How many times uh, as great as the baseball's volume is the beach ball's volume? All right. So let's go through the steps we're going to kind of, I'm going to need your help filling in the blanks. At some point, I'm going to cut you loose with our properties to kind of finish the problem. All right, so we read the problem. We usually figure out what we know and what we don't. So they say, hey, let R equal something. So what are we supposed to let R equal in this case? What R are they referring to? Look carefully. R for Ray. Go ahead. 
The radius of what, though? Duke it out. Ready, set, go. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Kendall's right. Yeah, it's the radius of the baseball in this case. So plain old R is the radius of the baseball. Hey, Kendall, how'd you come to that conclusion? We do. Yeah, excellent. I really like that. That's different than how I thought about it, but you're absolutely right. I didn't think of it that way. We know nothing about the baseball, so that has to be our variable. We do know something about the beach ball's radius, don't we? Uh, we do know something about the radius of the beach ball. It's not R. Courtesy of Kendall. Uh, so what would it be instead of R? Go ahead, Antoine. It would be 5.6 R. It's very good. So why would you say that? Ooh. Yeah, the word times is like right there. you got to use it, right? So it says 5.6 times greater than the radius of the baseball. So it has to be 5.6 R. Are we okay with that? Okay, that's what we know and what we don't. Then they wrote the verbal model for us, but let's talk about why they came up with that. So what they have here is a ratio of the beach ball's volume to the baseball's volume. So my question is, why is it set up like that? Why isn't it like baseball over beach ball? Ooh, do you know, Anton? Uh, well, yeah. And if you look at what they're asking for in the problem, it says how many times as great as the baseball's volume is the beach ball's volume. So you're looking for the bigger number. If the beach ball's bigger than the baseball, we're going to take our big number and divide it by our small number to get a big number. If you did a small number divided by your big number, you're going to get a small number back out. And that's not how many, how many times as great, you know. It's, it's not. Does that make sense? Everybody sees why it's a ratio? Normally I'd have you walk through that a little bit if we had a little bit more time. Okay, so beach ball's volume. Just to let you know, volume of a sphere, a little throwback to your geometry classes, volume of a sphere goes four thirds pi r cubed. Ooh. <laughs> four pi r squared would be area for your sphere, yeah. So it's a little bit different for volume. Volume's always cubed, cubic something, yeah. Area squared. So, do you see how on the bottom, they have the baseball's volume as just four-thirds pi r cubed? That's because r, remember back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, that's because r is the radius of the baseball. So, like I said, your mission is to fill in the blanks. What goes in this first box right here? Did you hear that? Hunter, did you hear that? That's a no. Okay, so she just answered, and I'm going to ask you now. What goes in that box? R is one of the things that goes in that box, but we're talking about the beach ball's volume. 5.6 R? Yeah. So 5.6 R is what goes in there. Okay, and then they say, hey, Use your properties of exponents from this point down to give me an answer. Tell me how many times as great the beach ball's volume is when compared to the baseball's volume. So I'm going to go ahead and cut you loose with your properties right now to give me an answer to that problem. Here's what I need you to think about as you're going through and you're doing your calculation. I need you to make a little prediction. I see some of you writing. You're going to finish before I have you make your prediction. Stop! Okay. I need you to think about it. Would you get just 5.6 out of all of this? Is the radiuses kind of comparison 
you know, the radius of the baseball was R, the radius of the beach ball was 5.6 R. Is that going to be the same number by which our volume relates? Yeah, so now you're going to test that. Ready, set, go. You're right, by the way. I hear that you folks are eager to move on. So with that, um, I did want to go ahead and give you a moment to check yourself. Tickety check yourself. Exactly, Ray. Well said. Um, final answer for this. Remember when you respond to a word problem or something that's not just cut and dry, solve for X, you got to give me some sort of sentence to show me that you know what that number means, right? So the volume of the beach ball is 175.6 times as great as the volume of a baseball. The volume of a beach ball is 175.6 times as great as the volume of the baseball. So I guess the uh, question I have for you is, as I walked around, you guys did a great job. But does anybody have any questions? Did I miss anybody? Joe, what's up, bud? Uh, my primary conduit by which I arrived at that response, do you see the power of a product property? As long as there's no plus or minus in your parentheses, Joe, you're going to take that 3, that exponent, and distribute it to the coefficient, 5.6, and to the r. So that's where the 5.6 cubed comes in. This guy right here. You have to take the 3 and distribute it to the 5.6 and to the r. Okay. Any other questions about that? All right, let's take a look at that homework, shall we?